This is a photo of 46-year-old Gail Clevenger. It's late 2018, and this occasion would be just one of several regular outings with her mother, Kathy Gretzky. Here, like most other times, they spend some time with each other over coffee and dessert. It's Gail's treat. Gail and Kathy are very close. They talk to each other just about every day over the phone about various issues, including those affecting Gail. The word issues here is carrying significant weight. That's because this photo holds a particular significance in this context. It would be the last one taken by Kathy before Gail disappears. We're in Florida. It's been a while, this time in DeBerry in Volusia County. It's a small town with nearly 25,000 people located about 30 minutes north of Orlando. For anyone considering walking, that'll take you about 10 hours. This place has at least nine parks. Its kids go to middle and high schools in Deltona in Orange City. It has a commuter train called the Sunrail. Compared to the rest of the nation, it's got an average crime rate, and it's here where this sad tale places us. Hi, you've reached Gail Clevenger. Sorry I missed your call. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. It was 10.30 a.m. on Friday, November 2, 2018, when Gail's employer, an architecture firm called Rhodes & Brito Architects, tried calling her. The 46-year-old wasn't picking up. She was supposed to start that day at 8.30 a.m., but she did not call or tell them in advance that she would be late or absent. This was weird because she had just started this job two weeks ago. Several hours later, Gail's son, 15-year-old Gregory Ramos, hops off the school bus in DeBerry and starts walking home from school. Gregory went to University High School at 1000 West Rhode Island Avenue in Orange City, Florida. At 3.45 p.m. as he's approaching his home at 35 Alicante Drive, Gregory immediately notices something is off. He hears the sound of the engine of his mom's 2007 10 Toyota van idling in the driveway. This is not normal because the van shouldn't be at home at this time. The routine was that after dropping Gregory off at school at 6.30 a.m., Gail would drive to the DeBerry Sunrail Station where she would grab her bike from the van and take the 7 a.m. train to Orlando. She would then bike the rest of the way to Rhodes and Brito. So, Gregory did the obvious thing. 911, where's your emergency? Um, I, I, I just got home, and the, the, my house is completely trashed. It looks like someone broke in the side door. Okay. How long have you been, how long have you been gone? I've been gone all school day. Um, I okay. got home. Are you there by yourself? Yeah. I'm How old are you? I'm, are I'm you? 15. Okay. And my, my mom's car is here and it's on and she's not home. And she's supposed to go to work today and I can't okay, find your her. Mom is, okay. Okay. Your mom's car is there. Is there any other way she ever gets to work? Does she ever get a ride from anyone else? She, no, she, it's on. The car is on. It's turned on. The car on. is on, and you're sure she is not there? I searched the entire place. I've been here for like eight minutes. I've been looking. Okay. I can't find her. Okay, I want you to stay on the phone with me. We are not going to disconnect until I have an officer that is with you, okay? Okay. Okay, Do we? did you see anyone leave the house? No. Okay. Stay on the phone with me. I'm making a couple of notes. Are you safe where you're at? Yeah, yeah, that doesn't sound like there's anyone here. I checked the entire house because I was looking for her, but she's not here. <laughs> when police arrived, they noticed a home had clearly been rummaged through. It looked like a robbery. Valuables were missing. It was described as though a hurricane had blown through, which was apt, considering parts of Florida were dealing with a heavy storm at this time. But what was far more concerning was that Gail was nowhere to be found. When asked what happened the night before, Gregory told police that he and his mom had dinner. He then went to his bedroom to do some homework, and then he went to bed. 
After speaking with one of Gregory's friends, 17-year-old Dylan Sagrilak at his home, a detective came upon evidence at the rear parking lot of a Crunch Fitness at 1200 Deltona Boulevard. Inside the dumpsters were a white printer, silver radio, and a black DVD player. These were some of the valuables that were taken from Gail's home. Gail was the youngest of six children born in 1972. Her father, who died in 1986 when she was just 13, had Crohn's disease that developed into kidney failure. She didn't get to spend a lot of time with him as he had been ill the last five or six years of his life, getting dialysis treatments three times a week. The blonde woman was described as animated, vocal, selfless, and intelligent, having been in gifted programs during her school years. She would help her mom with shopping, spoil her with the aforementioned dessert dates, and call her every day, usually in the evening, just to chat. She was a member of the National Junior Honor Society, the marching band, and the cheerleading squad in junior high school. She was similarly involved in the National Honor Society and the marching band in high school. She also competed and was a judge in the sport of gymnastics. Gail excelled in academics, focusing her efforts on becoming an architect. After high school, she enrolled in the University of Miami School of Architecture. She spent a year in Glasgow, Scotland, in her third year to study at the Charles Rennie Macintosh School of Architecture there. She then came back to Miami for her final year. She eventually would become a member of the American Institute of Architects and the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. Gail spent very long hours on her studies to get here. She is said to have regularly been up till 4 in the morning in the studio working on models for her classes. The lack of sleep, plus the sadness she suffered from when her boyfriend broke up with her, perhaps left her yearning for stress relief. Enter the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It was founded in the United States in 1965 by Swami Prabhupada, an Indian religious leader and author who brought its headquarters to New York. Krishna itself is a supreme deity to the followers of the movement, called Hare Krishna, which comes from the group's chants during self-meditation and in public spaces, a sign of their devotion to Krishna. The group believes that the sound vibration of the chant has a direct impact on the soul, which is philosophically seen by ancient India as a dormant thing that needs to be awakened to its spiritual reality and connection to the Supreme Deity. Followers are strict vegetarians and avoid intoxication, illicit sex, and gambling. Despite appearing like an ordinary religious denomination, Hare Krishna has been targeted by accusations that it promotes brainwashing. The 1980 film Cult Explosion features the movement alongside other so-called cults, including the Manson family, Scientology, the Latter-day Saints, the Unification Church, and the Transcendental Meditation. The movement's first converts were hippies in New York, according to Britannica, and has temples and cultural centers in several U.S. cities, including Miami. During her studies in Miami, Gail had decided she wanted to try going vegetarian for a bit, perhaps with the assistance of some of her peers who were also vegetarian. So she was introduced by her friends to the Hare Krishna temple near the university, where it served vegetarian food one night a week. She was henceforth absorbed into the Krishna worship experience, the rhythmic music and dancing and all of that. Gail stopped attending Catholic Mass during this time. After graduating from the University of Miami, Gail spent some time in Colorado with a college friend before taking up a job at an art studio in Brooklyn, New York, which specialized in outdoor art. It was here that she became deeply involved with the Hare Krishna movement and spent lots of time at the temple near her home. During the year she was devoted to the movement, there would be long stretches where she wouldn't call, text, or send any type of communication to her mother Kathy, who was mortified by the idea because she felt it was a cult. It was a little over a year after this that Kathy said Gail suffered an emotional breakdown. Mother Danishta of the temple told Gail that she needed to call her mother to come get her. So, Kathy flew in from Florida to bring her home to Titusville. 
While in Brooklyn, Kathy observed that Gail would apply yellow chalk on her chest and forehead in the morning. Before leaving the state, Gail brought a kid's wagon and put a bunch of her belongings in it and wheeled it to the local Catholic church in Brooklyn and donated much of it there. She would encourage her family to do the same with their stuff, as Hare Krishna followers rejected materialism. Quote, she was deeply under the influence of the cult for many months, her mother Kathy would tell lawyers, adding she was, quote, strange and not herself, and seemed like she was in a, quote, different mental realm. She had stayed with her mother in Florida and attempted to find work there. She didn't have trouble finding work. Her problem was staying employed. She had been fired from at least 10 different jobs over the space of four months because of her odd behavior. Then came the day of the party. Kathy was holding a celebration after officially retiring from her job at Computer Sciences Raytheon in Patrick Air Force Base. Gail's oldest sister Lynn was coming from Key West to Titusville with her two children in tow for the party. Lynn put the children to bed while at her mother's home, as Gail was decorating the condo's recreation room downstairs. Gail wanted help, so she woke up Lynn's children for assistance, despite Lynn telling her not to wake them up. This enraged Lynn, and the two got into a heated shouting match. It got so bad that police were called. As we've discussed in a previous video, Florida has a mental health law called the Baker Act that allows police to take a person against their will to get medical assistance if they believe they are a danger to themselves or others. Unfortunately, Gail was Baker Acted. She was taken to Circle of Care, where she spent the next 48 hours under supervision. Kathy called this a terrible mistake. She said she thought the police would resolve the situation right then and there without Gail leaving. After being released, Gail asked her mother if she could seek counseling with Father Leo Hodges of the Catholic Church. Remnants of her Krishna habits, however, would remain as the Catholic Church attempted to bring her back. Her mother observed that she would only eat a little portion of her food, move some over to the side of the plate, and then place the plate next to the window as an offering to Krishna. Gail was coming out of her Krishna phase when she signed up with a group called the Catholic Volunteers in Florida. That's when her life truly changed forever. Gail and her mother were full-time members of the Catholic Volunteers in Florida, which matched people with those who couldn't take care of themselves. These people would be the elderly or those who came out of surgery. Gail and her mother were provided a place to live in Orlando and a stipend of $500 per month for their time. Gail was tasked with being a companion for a woman in the city. In the area was another caretaker named Gregory Ramos, though he wasn't a member of the Catholic Volunteers. Gail and Gregory would formally meet. They would talk to each other often. Then, they suddenly started dating. This wasn't a good thing, Kathy would say. One weekend, Gail introduced Gregory to the family. Quote, We all could see that he was loud, aggressive, and controlling toward Gail, Kathy said. A couple of months later, to Kathy's horror, the two announced they were getting married. Gail had, by then, lost her position as a volunteer. Kathy didn't want to go to the wedding because she did not support the relationship. But her daughters convinced her to go in support of Gail, not knowing by then that Gail had already been pregnant and that's probably why they were rushing to get married. It was only during counseling with the priest that Kathy would learn of Gail's sexual promiscuous past during her time in Brooklyn, which Kathy said was not normal behavior for her daughter. Kathy would hypothesize that Gail was still in a mentally and emotionally vulnerable state when Gregory entered her life. Gregory Sr. was manipulative and controlling, according to Kathy, who one day allegedly discovered notes on Gail's computer detailing the sexual, physical, and verbal abuse he leveled against her. It was said that Gail was graped and occasionally had her nipples pinched by Gregory until she was in pain. He forced Gail to take the bus to her job at the Borders Bookstore in Winter Park, even though she had a car on her own. That car was used by Gregory whenever he wanted. He would allegedly buy drugs and pornography. He would not allow Gail to spend time with the family at all, even on Christmas. Kathy would recall that his violent abuse only grew worse after she gave birth to her son.
On the day of Gail's disappearance, police reached out to the Volusia County School Board and learned that Gail's son, Gregory Jr., checked himself out of the school at roughly 1pm and did not ride any Volusia school buses on that day. Police also noticed scratches on the bridge of Gregory's nose and underneath both of his eyes, which he said was the result of a fight he had with his friend Dylan. But when asked by police again, he would say it was the result of a fight with another friend named Joel. Police then asked for more information about what occurred the night before. Gregory said that when he got home from school, he had dinner with his mom. At the table, they had a little bit of an argument over a grade. Gail asked for the boy's phone, an LG with a red silicone case, and grounded him for the night. That night, Gregory told police that he pretended to fall asleep. At around 12.30am on November 2, he snuck into his mom's room and took his phone. He then called his friends to come over. When they arrived at 1.30 a.m., they hopped into Gail's van and went to get alcohol. The friends went to a 7-Eleven, then to the River City Presbyterian Church at 267 East High Banks Road, which had a fire pit behind it. Gregory said the friends went between the home and the fire pit all night until 5 a.m. when Gregory went home, got ready for school, and took a quick nap before Gail woke him up at 6 a.m. Gregory said Gail then dropped him off at school at roughly 6.40 a.m. But if he didn't take the school bus, then how did he get home? Gregory explained that him and those same friends checked out of school at 1 p.m., after which Dylan drove Gregory to his home to get money, and then they went back to the fire pit. Gregory said nothing was out of the ordinary when he was taken home. The boys then hung out at the fire pit until 3.30 p.m. when Gregory was dropped off at Naranja Road and High Banks Road, from which he walked the rest of the way home. When police went to speak to Dylan at 9-11 Fairbairn Court in Deltona, he said Gregory was his math tutor and that the last time he saw him was at lunch. Dylan had a pass to leave school early because he had work obligations, so he asked 17-year-old Brian Porras to take him to his job in Sanford. Dylan said he worked between 3.30pm and 5pm, after which his grandmother picked him up. When police confronted him about the inconsistent stories, Dylan folded like a lawn chair. At 6.15am on the morning of Gail's disappearance, Dylan said he and Brian picked up Gregory for school. As they were driving, Gregory told them that he had killed his mom. Gregory Ramos Jr. was born on June 14, 2003. When Gail was at work, the baby's father, Gregory Sr., would take care of him because he didn't have a job. It is alleged that Gregory Sr. fed the baby with a bottle using a propping method, meaning instead of holding the baby while he fed, he used an item, like a pillow or another device, against which to rest the bottle so he didn't have to hold the bottle or the baby. Gail's mother, Kathy, said that when the baby was taken for a pediatrician's visit, the doctor said one side of Gregory Jr.'s head was unusually flat, which can be a symptom of being fed using the propping method for an extended period. The baby's head would eventually correct itself due to the malleability at a young age. Gregory Sr. was allegedly physically abusive toward Gregory Jr. Gail told Kathy that she saw Gregory Sr. slapping the baby's cheeks hard. Pleading with him to stop, Gregory Sr. said he had to, quote, toughen him up. He also allegedly frightened the baby by getting close to his face and making loud animal sounds. You know, to toughen up the baby. He would also prevent Gail from holding, clothing, comforting, or feeding her baby for hours. Gregory Sr. was allegedly emotionally, verbally, physically, and sexually abusive to Gail. Despite sticking by his side, Gail was said to be terrified of Gregory Sr., Kathy said. What's more, it is said that Gail also dealt with sexist colleagues at work, so she was being squeezed. Kathy tried to get Gail to leave him, but she refused on the expectation that things would get better. They didn't. The saving grace came when Gregory Sr. was arrested on domestic violence charges, which saw Gail and the baby taken to the domestic violence shelter in Sanford. While they were at the shelter, Gregory Sr. bailed out of jail and took all the belongings at Gail's place, likely to sell them. He eventually left Arkansas and would remarry and have four more children. Gail got full custody of baby Gregory, but did not receive any money from his father, according to Kathy. While Gail and her son lived in the shelter, she took up a second job teaching the modeling software CAD, 
three nights a week. She put baby Gregory in the nursery at the First Methodist Church in Sanford. Kathy would come by and pick up the baby until it became too much, and Kathy elected to purchase an apartment in Sanford to be close to the baby. By then, Gail took money she was given by the Florida government for people in the shelter and rented an apartment, sleeping on an air mattress while Gregory slept in a used crib. She eventually had the apartment furnished through donations. They lived in the apartment for a few years. When Gregory turned three, Kathy recalled him crying and asking, quote, Why don't I have a father? Likely after seeing other kids in pre-kindergarten being picked up by their dads. Kathy told him that his father is sick and has some problems so they can't see him. But she added that when he's older, maybe you'll have the opportunity to see him. Gail would later meet and marry a man named Daniel Clevenger, who was just getting divorced from his previous partner with two children of his own in tow. Problem was that Daniel had work in Seattle, so Gail was alone with her child for some periods. It was around this time that Gail, while working at CPH Engineering in Sanford, passed her architecture licensing exams. This allowed her to apply for jobs with more responsibilities and therefore a bigger salary. It was then, in October 2018, when she secured the job at Rhodes and Burrito, where she worked just two weeks before her murder. Part of the problem with the family picture was that Gail wasn't a confident mother, according to Kathy. Gail would call her sisters to ask for advice on how to raise her kid. Past abuse, parenting struggles, and a new job were forces that were colliding into a terrible storm of stress that would sweep the family household. Growing up, Gregory Ramos Jr., the boy with the round face and big blue eyes, was described as a polite, compassionate, motivated, and smart kid who loved learning, teaching, and helping others. He was generally well-behaved, though he was dorky, goofy, and loved making jokes. He also had a desire to fit in. He would, quote, get hyper when talking about things that excited him, according to the mother of a friend of Gregory. He attended Midway Elementary from kindergarten through second grade. He was an excellent student during these years, according to Kathy. He would subsequently win awards for academic excellence in elementary and middle school. He was following in the footsteps of his mother, who was in the gifted programs throughout her school years. He was a cub and boy scout, earning badges and pins and rising to senior patrol leader. He also loved camping, taekwondo, and outdoor activities like water parks. Because he had multiple surgeries to correct his club feet when he was very young, he had difficulties doing certain physical activities, like running and carrying heavy backpacks for extended distances, as was required by the scouts. He loved strategy games, like the Axes and Allies board game based on World War II. He entered the Police Explorer program at 14, which puts young people of high school age through a program to expose them to what law enforcement is like. Gregory wanted to be a police officer and then eventually wanted to make a career as a detective. In the summer of 2018, he completed the Police Explorer's grueling two-week event in which he won the most improved trophy. He was enrolled in University High School in 2016. He did, however, express a desire to be homeschooled by his mother for whatever reason, according to the mother of a friend of Gregory. Kathy took care of Gregory since he was five months old. Those were during periods in which Gail was working and there wasn't a father present. She described him as being vocal, but he was easy to be with and easy to care for. She would have short conversations every day with a boy when he got his cell phone as a form of checkup. But there was something under the veneer of success that was troubling Gregory. In the summer before entering the ninth grade, Gregory became more withdrawn, sad, and tired, according to his seventh grade teacher Kimberly. One day, Gail approached Kimberly and opened up to her about her struggles with parenting and arguments she had been having at home with Gregory. After telling them what he had done, Gregory Jr. advised his friends that he needed their help staging a robbery at his home. The trio left school before sixth period and went to Gregory's home. 
Dylan said the home was already a mess. Brian observed that Gregory was shaking. Gregory then gave both Dylan and Brian belongings to hide at their home so it would appear as though they were stolen in a robbery gone wrong. Dylan later told police about the locations of where they stored some of Gail's belongings, including those in the Crunch Fitness trash and in a dumpster near Winn-Dixie in Deltona. Dylan said Gregory also gave him a rifle to hide at his home, but he instead hid it in the woods near the River City Presbyterian Church, where police would be taken to other hidden items, including laptops and a gun case. More importantly, it was there, in the fire pit area the friends hung out at, where Gail was buried. Gail was still finding her bearings parenting her little Gregory. While she was at the shelter, she had taken parenting courses alongside her financial independence and counseling sessions, all part of the requirements to show she was a responsible parent when she filed for full custody of Gregory. The pressure was mounting when her husband Daniel was away for work for weeks at a time. Daniel had been away during the week of Gail's murder, so she was shouldering the burden of being a relatively new parent in a new architecture job she had coveted for so long. So naturally, Gail was under a lot of pressure to impress. Starting in Gregory's third or fourth grade, Gail's patience with her son could be described as wearing thin. She had developed a bad temper. Kathy, who was the subject of Gail's rage at times, believed that her temper may have been the result of the abuse she suffered at the hands of Gregory Sr. It was around this period that Gail would begin to get upset with Gregory over missed assignments or bad grades. There were at least two ways parents at Gregory's school could catch up on the progress of their students. They either would get an email from teachers, or they had access to something called a parent portal to check the grades of the students. Whenever Gail would be notified of poor performance, Kathy would say Gail would pick him up from school after work, walk inside the house without greeting Kathy, and tell him to go to his room. Inside, she would yell at him. He wouldn't respond. Kathy also recalled a time when Gregory was building a structure with Legos after completing his homework. When he showed Gail, who was still fuming after yelling at the boy, she would take the structure apart and tell him that it was time to put it away. Kathy wanted Gail to take it easy, but she was steadfast in her discipline. Kathy noted that Gregory would be hurt by the fact that he wouldn't get positive feedback on his work. Gail admitted to his teacher Kimberly that she would completely lose her cool with Gregory sometimes, digging up old mistakes he'd made during heated arguments. Kimberly noted that Gail looked exhausted. The tension from the arguments would last for weeks. Kimberly said Gail admitted that she was worried that she had not handled certain situations with Gregory well at all. Kimberly herself said she had seen a drastic change in Gregory's demeanor and personality whenever he came to church, which was far less often than before. She said he was very withdrawn. Gail had asked Kimberly to call him on one occasion to ask how he was doing. Gail thought Gregory would be more open with his struggles with his teacher instead of her. Quote, He was not as happy and joyful as he once had been, Kimberly would say. He was sluggish and didn't really seem to want to be there. Even Daniel, Gail's new husband, wouldn't show that much affection to Gregory, according to Kathy. Daniel would go out to certain places with his biological son Riley, but not with Gregory, Kathy would say. As Gregory got older, he started talking back when Gail would yell at him, swearing and cursing his mother out. While his step-siblings were considered well-behaved, Gregory would seemingly get in trouble all the time for various things. At 14, for example, he was caught talking to an older girl, which Gail didn't like. He was taken to counseling. Kathy posited that Gregory may have felt like he was the only one getting in trouble among his siblings. Gail and Daniel didn't tell Kathy about Gregory's problems while they were happening because they were concerned about her blood pressure. But there was also a pressure building within Gregory that Gail may not have fully realized. A little over a week before Gail's disappearance, a former teacher of Gregory's spotted him and two of his friends smoking cigarettes. The teacher pulled over at the side of the road on Rhode Island and hollered at Gregory. 
While Gregory didn't acknowledge her, his friends did and gave her the middle finger. When the teacher got home, she texted Gregory and asked, Does your mom know you are smoking? He called her back and told the teacher that he had been experiencing a lot of stress in his life, especially at home. She reminded him that she could come and chat with him in the classroom and that the stress was no reason to be taking up smoking. But by then, it was too late. At 8.47pm on November 1, 2018, Gail and 15-year-old Gregory were sitting at the dinner table. Gail had her head resting in the palms of her hands. She was upset. Again. Gregory had gotten a D in biology. Not near good enough for Gail, who was the model student in her school years. After shouting at Gregory, he alleged that she hit him in the face. Gregory then ran to his room. At midnight, as Gail was in bed, Gregory went into her bedroom and continued the argument. But he had physical altercation in mind this time. As they were shouting at each other, he pounced on Gail and started strangling her. He grabbed her from the bed and toward the floor and near the wall. He said the struggle took about 30 minutes. After believing she was dead, he retrieved a wheelbarrow to put her in. But when he returned to the bedroom, Gail was still alive and moving slowly on the floor. So, Greg jumped on top of her and strangled her until he knew for sure that she was dead this time. He watched as her life escaped her body. Gregory told police he had to kill her because he believed she would eventually kill him at some point in the future, claiming that this was some type of preemptive self-defense. It is important to note that Gregory's claim that Gail hit him was the first instance from all the accounts I've seen of any physical discipline being used. If it's true, Gregory may have thought this was an escalation by Gail. Gregory then bound her feet together, put her in the wheelbarrow, and wheeled her to the van where he dragged her by the feet into the back of the van. He then went back inside and started throwing stuff around, taking some valuables with him to the van. He then drove the van to Daytona where he discarded the wheelbarrow, but not Gail. He drove her body to the River City Presbyterian Church where he buried her in the fire pit area behind the church under a ring of stones. He then threw some items from the home into the woods. He then went back home and got ready for school. That's when his friends Dylan and Brian picked him up. After school, the boys agreed to assist in the staging of the robbery, which involved opening up all the cabinets and drawers, shattering cups and dishes, kicking in the door on the south side of the house to assist in Gregory's claim of forced entry, and taking items with them. 17-year-old Brian and 17-year-old Dylan both pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact to second-degree murder. Brian was sentenced to 14 years of probation, with the first 364 days in the Volusia County Branch Jail. Dylan was sentenced to 10 years of probation. Gregory eventually pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, abuse of a dead body, and tampering with physical evidence. He was sentenced to 45 years in state prison, with a possibility of parole after 25 years because he was a juvenile at the time of the crime. Gregory told the court he takes full responsibility for his actions. He said he doesn't deserve to live and that he acknowledged ruining many lives close to him, but that he loved those who helped raise him. I understand that you might have heard this case before, but I wanted to make a point that context matters. The consequence of an absence of such context is that we're left to draw conclusions based on insufficient information. This crime did not happen in a vacuum. You might have heard that a kid killed his mother over a bad grade. That's insane. His legal custodian would beg to differ. Quote, Nobody kills somebody over a bad grade. So there's more, Kathy told lawyers in a recorded session that the defense hopes will be used at Gregory's parole hearing in 25 years. The more consists of the fact that Gail was under great duress because her husband had been out of town all week, which meant she had all the responsibility for the car, the house, the dog, the shopping, and she was only two weeks into a brand new job trying to impress people and make a good first appearance. 
So the fact that she was feeling all alone without Daniel there to help her co-parent, as she called it, and the fact that she had total responsibility dealing with a new job, and then learning about the bad grade, was the icing on the cake that caused her to become more angry than a normal situation. Because all of these other things had come into play at that time. As for Gregory's progress, he went on to complete his high school diploma a year early in jail with no access to a computer. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate the story, which is based on the primary sources. Special thank you as always to the local reporters who keep us informed about these stories and to you guys for providing your thoughts. I used to have a disclaimer near the beginning of the video that said insignificant details may be dramatized for flow which confused some people, so I will start explaining it a little bit at the end. That disclaimer just means, in building a narrative, I need to make inferences about what likely happened or how a phone conversation went based on the facts. For example, in this case, when Gail's employer left a voicemail, I'm not sure what Gail's voicemail message was exactly, so I used a generic one. In any event, be well, feed the poor, and I'll see you next time.